He's one of the busiest dudes in this industry. He hosts Ona's Awesome Fishing Show as well as Bass Live. And he just happens to be one of my best friends on this entire planet. The Z Train, Mark Sona, this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Happy hump day to all of you. Welcome in. All of you, friends, family, freeloaders, it doesn't matter. Everybody is welcome here. Happy hump day. Um, a big week. Hard to believe it's already freaking September. In my part of the world, lots of stuff is going on. I mean, kids are going back to school, which I thought I hated when I was a little kid, but I feel as an adult, I hate it even more now. I mean, I like hanging out with my kids. It, it um, It's fun. Uh, I wish they were around all the time. But um, to all the kids going back to school, I hope you have a good week. And with that in mind, I'll just take a moment to say, if you are one of said children listening to this podcast while you're at school, probably shouldn't be doing that. But but stick with me for a few minutes here. Be kind to somebody. Going back to school is tough for a lot of kids. I mean, I would say going back to school is tough for the majority of kids. Uh, they're nervous. They're worried. Whatever. You can change somebody's day by literally just flashing them a smile or saying hi, asking how their summer was. Little Things like that um, make a big difference in this world. And you have no idea the snowball that starts. You smile at one person, then they're a little happier and go so on and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. That's kind of the whole theory behind this podcast. I mean, because it is so easy in the podcast world to literally just go negative, go controversial. I mean, it's so easy. You will get plays, you will get clicks, and you will get enemies and that will continue to fuel things and but the world has enough of that garbage okay on this silly little podcast we try to just have a fun educational i mean it goes in all different directions whatever way the the guest wants it to go is literally where this podcast goes but we try to do it by being kind and that's all i'm asking so students or people returning to work be a little kinder out there make the world a better place. Speaking of making the world a better place, I'm going to miss my kids because they're they're at school during the day. But the good thing is the NFL is about to be back in my life, which is a big thing for me. I know not all of you are big NFL fans, and you will often tell me in the comments that you are not. So whether you are or aren't, that's fine. I'm obsessed by it, so I'm probably going to mention it every once in a while. And And so is this week's guest, who I think is the perfect guest for this particular week. I mean, he we're, we're supposed to recap last year's schedule and the new schedule that just came out and just kind of talk about all things Z-Train. And um, that's exactly who our guest is, one of my best friends on earth. I mean, if it wasn't for this dude, there is no way I get a job at Bass. Um, there's no way I get to accomplish or get to experience, not accomplish, but experience half the things that I get to experience in my life. And um, but most of all, I'm thankful for his friendship because he is one of my best friends on this entire planet. A strange one, but still one of my best friends. And I'm also extra thankful that he made time for us this week because, I mean, he's in like 38 different fantasy football leagues. So I'm amazed he even has time to sketch, you know, chunk it out or whatever. But maybe he book this by mistake who knows without further ado let's bring him in one of the busiest guys in this entire industry the host of zona's awesome fishing show the host of bass live a man who has never eaten not one egg in his entire life the z train mark zona you know you, you have good friends on earth and then you have the the kind of really good friends that either mistakenly agree to do this on labor day or are good enough friends to do it on labor day z which are you i i agreed to it i think on thursday or friday and then this morning i was like damn it i forgot i had to do this <laughs> <laughs> but I, hey thanks back to you for sneaking me in early before the the end of summer festivities began today so you have been partaking in said festivities 
the last little while, I guess. Well, it's the weekend end of summer. Or? You know, the kids are home from California. So, yeah, I, I, I have really, Dave, and you, when you've been here on Labor Day weekend, <laughs> oh. it is a, it is a time. It is a beach combing time. And that's what it was. It, it, you know, the exciting thing this week. So, the, I, I, I brought the kids to the airport this morning at some embarrassing time. Uh, and, and Taku, Taku is coming tomorrow uh, oh. to, to hang at Zona's house for the week. Two so, worlds could have collided. I think it would it, have been special. I, well, it's best that Taku wasn't here the last three days. It was, you know, I was I was the the mentor and and made sure everybody somewhat got to bed on time, somewhat, <laughs> and it was a awesome end of the summer week weekend so but excited about taku coming really excited that'll be a fun visit he's honestly dude and i've said this i mean we texted about it a few days ago he is one of the coolest yes. individuals on earth like aside from fishing it's just amazing to to spend time with him like to see somebody who I mean, me and you don't like to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions at all. And he literally lives in an uncomfortable position his entire life. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, something, something this, I'm going to rewind real quick. So I was, uh, this is no joke, Dave. I was taping on Lake Ontario a month ago and we were in between tournaments and it was very hectic. Everybody, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, and dude, I made a run, right? I made a run out there, not, not, not a, not a 20 mile run. I made a run. I saw one boat out there. It was Taku. I was like, <laughs> why are you? It, and I texted him. I said, did I see you on Lake Ontario? Yes. Having fun fishing, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in all honesty, that is what, I mean, that dude is lives on the water, lives on the water, and very, very excited to to fish with him this week. I'm going to take him to a couple really, really cool special lakes that I think he he said he does not like powerful largemouth, and I have a feeling we're 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 going to a lake where he's going to need to power up this week a little bit. So it's going to be like a boot camp. You're going to whip him into largemouth shape. Let me just put it this way, Dave. I I'm. I know that he said Norio Tanabe, I believe, is his master, his mentor. By the end of this week, I'm going to try to be Taku's mentor. That's what that's what this whole week is about. Wow. So are you shooting yeah. shows or just hanging out? We're just hanging. <laughs> so not even shooting a show. So this nobody will see this. It's just no. you and Takumi wandering the streets of Michigan. He texted me, I'm coming to Zona's house. That's all I got. I said, come, come bring it. <laughs> And yes, you are. You will be yes. at Zona's house. Yes, and wow. he said, I'm coming to Zona's house, and I like steak. I, You're coming to the right place. You're coming to the right place, Taco. Yeah. He tells me all he eats now is steak. He said, I need to eat lots of steak to build muscles. And and I've confirmed with Sego. Sego's like, yeah, no, like he eats an incessant amount of steak. Dave, you've been to my house. Mm -hmm. There is no lack of beef on a grill here. What we did yesterday, I'm dead serious. I cooked for 42 people yesterday on an open fire, not a, not a grill, in open fire. Like, why do you do man. that? I don't know. Uh, every time it's awesome. Every time I've ever been to your house, we have breakfast on an open flame and everything, but you have like technology and grills and stuff, but you always choose to do. Is it just there's the nothing better? There's nothing better than an open fire. But there's nothing worse than 40 human beings standing there wanting food. <laughs> <laughs> like it was it, by the end of it, we were just cutting shanks, shanks off of cuts of meat, just throwing it on an open fire. Like it was, it's awesome though. Like oh, the majority of the people that you know you you've been here, and the Lake Shore's kind of a happy-go-lucky place. Is uh, most weekend people, at Bernie's. Yes, yes. You know, uh, and uh, it what what's cool is, you know, football season starts and and hunting season starts, and most of these people that were here, uh, you know, we won't see them till next year. So it was a good time. And and not only that, it also puts, you know, what I mean by this, it kind of puts a little bit of a period not only on summer, 
but it does on on the season, on the Bassmaster season. I've, I've thought about that a lot the last week. So, yeah. What are you like at the end of the season? Like, does it affect you at all, or you've done it so long, you're just like, thank God we got through another one? No, I used to, what's, gosh, it's so strange you bring that up. I, I fished with Mark Rose last week before we did studio. Um, I stopped by his house and did a, a, a little video with him, and he made a comment or a question. He asked a question, and I didn't, I didn't think about it. It just rolled up off my tongue but he said do you have any do you have any regrets I said in our career in what we do and, and I said yeah I, I said I have one really big regret and I've, I've taken I've taken a, things for granted um not not big picture things but covering the Bass Masters working with you working with with Davey and and Such and Ronnie uh, and most of all, most of all, Tommy, um, I, I just, I don't want to take, whether we do this day for a year or five years or 10 years, I don't, I don't take little things for granted anymore, L which like, and, and I'm a lot like you, Dave, you get to the end of the year, you're like, oh, thank God, you know, it's done. I, it's weird. When I drove home, I called you and we were talking BS and is, is I don't want to take calling a tournament that, that. Brandon Polinick wins or Austin Felix wins or Taku wins or Seth Fighter winning Angler of the Year or Polinick this year it is I don't want to take those because I've always said this. I've said this to you. I don't care who wins. I don't care who wins. I do. I do care who wins. Um, maybe not some people back in the day. <laughs> I'm Who are sorry. those people? It's Who are those so people, easy. Z? It's so easy. Um, but but I don't want to take those those moments and, and the time that the times that we're together for granted anymore. Because you know, you you 10 years ago you think, oh gosh, it'd be so awesome if I could do this for another two years or five years or 10 years. Um and it's it, coming back from studio, the every you do this too is we all reflect on the season in our own quiet way when we decompress. And you de you have to decompress at the end of every day. I talked to Mike McInnes about this. You are, you are here when you get off the stage and then there is a automatic emotional deflation because you're not, now you're here and you, it, it's weird. Um, but we all have, I don't even know what that had to do with anything, anything, but we all decompress after a Bassmaster season in our own way. And last week when I drove home, I watched the sunrise. Um, dude, it's been a hell of a ride, Dave. Like it's been so awesome to be a small grain of sand in this industry, in, in this sport. Um, and we're lucky that, that's kind of what I've thought of. Now, don't get me wrong. When I got home, I was like, oh, thank God that's done, man. Let's go bass fishing. And hunt. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just the time of year where I switch gears and, and do other things. So, Do you think part of thinking like that is aging? You know, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I think everybody, no matter what their job is, they will look back at those years. And in many ways, those will be the good old days that they sit and yeah. tell stories about but you don't ever think about it. Like, I, I feel like I've gone through the same thing myself where at certain times our career as cool as it was, was coming at me so quick. And there was so yes. many, it was more or less, it was get to that finish line, get through this event, absolutely get to the next one, get home, get out of this traveling mess, get to the, but it, you're so, you're so stuck dealing with the immediate BS stuff. You know what I mean? That you yes. don't stop to be like, wow, I have the freaking job I dreamed of. <laughs> well, and, and not only that, Dave, and this for the, any of your, your viewers, um, you know this when, when, what doesn't matter what you do for a living, there's an initial, when you do something, there's a, okay, I need to figure out how to survive doing this. And then you get to a little bit of a point where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm surviving at this. Uh, and that, it, 
that's the meat of your career. And I guess, I guess now, now that probably we're in the last few innings of our career, I don't, I don't know. You tend to appreciate it more. You tend to kind of smell the roses. Uh, it's something, something else I, I've, I've thought about is it does not matter it, when you call a tournament, when you cover a tournament, you know, you're on stage. The most amazing thing about covering the Bassmasters is every single event, every single title, somebody touches, touches perfection in some way, shape or form. And I have a tendency to pay way more attention to that. Now, look, what I've, what I've done for the past 20 years is who caught them, how they caught them, where they caught them. That, that's, what, that's what my job has been. But I have a tendency now to kind of watch it a little. It, it's very, very hard to explain what I'm trying to explain right now. But to cover perfection, no matter who it is that wins a tournament, has been really cool, has been really cool because it's strange. I catch myself looking back at certain tournaments and I'm like, wow, that was amazing. And no matter what, you, Tommy, they, we are still fans of this oh, first yeah. and foremost. First and foremost, I mean, we are still chronic addicts. Like I love, whether I'm in studio here or I'm in, in studio in Little Rock, Dude, I love when live cranks. Like, what? Where are we headed today? I, I still absolutely love that feeling of trenching it. I, I do. It's been awesome. What's your favorite part about the job? Like, the, is it is it being on point at that exact moment when it really matters? You know, when that key fish catch, or is it just? Being able to just sit and talk, like what is like if you had to get one element that I love this job because I still love the what Bassmasters is. I still yeah. love learning. I still love talking to an angler or watching an angler and and just going, wow, wow, that's cool. Um, it it. It's very, it, it, that, that was, and still is like, I'm still an addict when it comes to dude, how'd you catch it? Like that is amazing, you know? And now, and now what's, what's neat is a lot of the lakes I have been to and fished multiple yeah. times to see things and learn things or, wow, I fished, I fished that dock or I fished that Creek. I know that, you know what I mean? It, it makes my job a hell of a lot easier now um, that I've, I've, I've had a lot of time on those bodies of water. But if there was to be one element, it, still, it's how'd you catch them? You know, that, that is still, to me, that is, it's why we all absorb this stuff. You know what I mean? Um, what were your wow moments from this season? Like in your head, what were the moments where you sat there and went, wow. Uh, you, uh, Jay Shakur, it, it was uh, I, I, ironic. It was the turn, the one tournament I take off a year. Um, that, that how do you I, do I, that, by the way? Bag. <laughs> <laughs> but Davey the rest said of us he are wondering. I had to get they, COVID they, like they, seven they, times. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna ask for two off next year. Anyway, so um, so Davey said he wanted to cover that tournament, and I texted you this. It was. It was really strange. At first, I looked at Karen and I'm like, how am I not covering this tournament? The dude is using a bait I designed, my rod, <laughs> a mile away from where I designed that bait. And then, and then what's funny is, from what's funny, Dave, is I was like, this is the best tournament to not be working because I sat back as a viewer and watch, I watched your weigh-ins and, and the, 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 um, th that was a, that was a wow moment this year for sure. And the other wow moment it, by far and away is Jason Christie, man. Uh, uh, hey, 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 hey. I, listen, there, there was classics that you and I covered 
that were physically and mentally painful to watch him. Yeah. Painful. And, and I remember, I, I remember hanging with him. I was at his house after, I don't even, uh, it was after the, the, the Hartwell classic that, and, and, and I was around a person that was so tormented by one event you you didn't want him to be you didn't want to want him to be Jim Kelly you know what I mean you you didn't want his career to not yeah. have come so damn close so close and not get it done for and and what's weird is for him to go to Hartwell and kind of exercise those demons that that's a, a I said this on live what are the astronomical odds the place that haunted him to go back to qualify for the elite series again and then go on to do that the odds of that are like lottery ticket like you know what I mean oh uh to to and I was worried because at the time, I honestly went into the last day thinking if Jason Christie doesn't win this classic, does oh he ever gosh. win a classic? You know what I mean. Not only you is it going, you said that uh, because I mean, and I'm sure he felt that way. But but I just think that's what made it so brilliant. Like the one thing that never got talked about a lot is his 30 minute drill that he did all year. He said he kept putting himself in positions when he'd have like 30 minutes left to fish, and he's like, I got 30 minutes. I need to go catch one and uh, he'd head to docks and he'd always, you know, pull I need to catch a three pounder. And that's what he came down to the drill that he repeatedly <sighs> drill. You know what I mean? Like it, 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 he will always have unfinished business to <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hey, listen, listen, you know, and what's, what's really strange about covering Jason He's Jason is not over the top on camera. He's not, it's not, but you just watch him. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? There, 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 it's not like, oh, this is, you, you, it, it's not like there, there's not something certain. It's just like when he, when he's fishing, it's like watching a really surgical quarterback to where you're like, wow, that, that dude is really good. <laughs> dude is really, really good. And, yeah. and that's that's what it is about. It, it's it, Polinick has the same thing, and, and and I and you know this. I I didn't when when I first when Polinick came along, I was like, yeah, you know, does he got the whole pe dude? Well, he, boy, he shut me up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll tell you where I really learned things about Polinick was when him and I fished together for small mile, we were on Lake, Lake Ontario years and years ago, and you fished with him on Lake Ontario. That, I think I'm pretty good with electronics. That dude got in my boat and I'm like, wow, I am the stupidest, dumbest human being on planet earth with electronics. Like he taught me that much. He started yelling at me for some of my settings. He's like, well, why you got this like this? Hey. So I, I'm like, oh, I'm just Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I just an I MC. Like it that way. I like it. Right. <laughs> There's a reason I introduce you. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, you know, it, it, I, I, I would say the Shakur and, and definitely, definitely uh, Christie at the Classic. And, and I'll tell you, it, 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 it's awesome. It was awesome to see Polinick win another Angler of the Year. But, but I'm like you. I, I, I want to see a Chris Johnston or a Brandon Lester get that, that title too. Yeah. I don't know. I, I like first time winners of big titles like that, just because it's, it's something a little bit different, but Chris Johnston is, oh. I, I remember you in particular when those guys left FLW, I, I knew their name. I, I knew Corey and I said, I hate to say there, but because I consider them one human being Corey, they're, they're different, but Corey and Chris to, they, they, somebody said to me a decade, now it was about eight years ago, hey, those are the two best smallmouth fishermen on earth. And I went, whatever. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I have fished extensively now with both of them for smallmouth. 
And I've been lucky enough to fish with some of the best smallmouth fishermen ever. They are absolutely at the top of that list. They are that. And it's weird. I, I can't put why. Um, they're, they're both very, obviously very fearless when it comes to big water. I think that's a huge distinct advantage that they have over a lot of the field and, and other smallmouth anglers. They, they, they will go to the ends of earth, but what's from, a, from a, a fishing standpoint, Dave, what I've learned about both of them is the light speed that they have when you are on a school, when you are on a school is light speed adjustments on baits that will catch the biggest fish in that school immediately to where I'll mope around, oh, let me get this out. They, they make that call so exponentially faster than other great smallmouth fishermen that I've been around. Uh, and, and the other thing is about those two, they they are tricky. They have baits and things that they don't like me to that they've shown me to where I'm like, oh BS, dude, that don't make that big. Yes, it does. Very, very they are both very, very detailed oriented smallmouth fishermen that pays big dividends by the end of an event. They're both incredible. I mean, the only way I've ever explained them is I'm like, they're generational talents. Yes. And honestly, yes. like there's, there is, and from every area, there comes different people that make it in the sport, but they are literally, you don't see anglers like them. Cause I mean, dude, three out of the last four years, there has been a Johnston in the top, not yes. just small mouth tournaments in the top three yes. for Bassmaster Angler of the Year, three out of the last four years. That's to me is incredible. Even as much as I bigged them before they came, I never imagined. I thought like, Hey, they're going to make a career out of the St. Lawrence river. Right, and they're going right. to, they're, they can hang, but I, I, it's amazing to see just how, how they're able to it, hang everywhere. Like they literally have, I mean. And here's, what's really odd. They don't have a lot we talk about how they how good they are on the st lawrence and lake ontario they don't have that much experience there it yes it's their home water but like just sitting there and bsing with Corey, we were having a, a beer and just talking about it and i was talking about he's like when, when did you start fishing here i'm like oh like 93 and he started laughing he's like yeah i've only been fishing here for like 11 years and i'm like how do you know all of like, and dude, when I tell you, he knows like a rock in 31 feet of water and generally can tell you the size of the fish you're going to set the hook on. Like two, <laughs> almost the ounce where I'm like, damn, it's a good rock, Corey. He's like, oh, I know. And like, we, <laughs> and here, here's another thing. So when we take together, we were fishing, like he would let you, we would let you catch one off that rock. He's like, I don't want to catch two off that rock. Let's just move on. Let's just keep <laughs> just keep going. But it was fun. The the show I shot with Corey recently was very very deep, which that, that is his his gig. And then we went really shallow and found a school of about five hundred of them that were not giants. They were you know four pounders, but there was hundreds upon hundreds of them that were not they were not the sharpest tools in the shed. So. <laughs> Yeah. Do, do you see a difference in either of them angling wise? No, there isn't no really difference. like the, there's it, no dude. There's no, no, it like, that's why I call them one person. They no, no. And, and it's, I, I've taped on all small mouth bodies of water. You know, one time I took Corey to St. Clair and then I took Chris, the to Buffalo. Finally, I was like, Hey dude, why don't you all take me somewhere? <laughs> right. But no, from a, an actual fishing standpoint, they are a unit. They're one unit. And, and they some, I mean, we've talked about this, Dave. We've talked about it on live. They somehow make that work. Yeah. Um, do, do I think that 
they probably have cost each other, potentially maybe cost each other a win here or there. Yeah. But as a whole, their system works, and which is hard to do. It's very hard. The other thing about, and I'm jumping all over. I love it. Keep going. They make, and I've said this on live, they make something that is so incredibly hard, whether it's conditions or fish movement, whatever it is, they make it look so easy. And I'm envious of that because, dude, I, you know, just beating your head in and waves and, uh, and things are breaking. Blah, blah, it, it, it affects you. They make their performance, especially in rough water conditions, they make it look so easy. And I'm so envious of that because it is so not easy to do what they do. No. And, and I'm sure I'm going to get a little hate from some of the folks I get to work with for saying this, but I, I think they changed the elite series. Like I literally think if you look at the amount of teams anglers working together, that there was pre Johnson. Now forget about anything before that, because the league basically restarted with a new group right. of anglers. Yes. But there wasn't a lot of teams before that. There was some people working together, but now the amount of like, just from this podcast, the amount of anglers I've had on here. And I say, do you work with somebody? And it is almost a rarity where in the past, it was a rarity to have someone say yes. Now it's a rarity to hear somebody say, no, I, the, I go all by myself. The outlier that's still out there. And I spoke with him about this is Hackney. Hackney yeah. will not, cannot Hackney. And here's what, his exact words were, he's like, I just don't understand these people that work together. Like, I cannot do that. <laughs> I cannot do that. That's, you know, and that's the, how he's wired. He is a loner. He rolls alone. And he genuinely, in his mind, cannot fathom, cannot understand two dudes sharing information. D does not work. He, his exact words were, I couldn't roll into a cove and somebody been like hey you catch him on a frog he's like i could not do that that's what works and i have and i have a very 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 high amount of respect for those people that that do it alone um to, you know the other side of like teams and and you we cover the guys that you know they fish near each other practice near each other um some of it is some what it appears to me to be also sponsor related a little bit um, it, 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 it's, a, that's a very, very, very hard thing to make work. Yeah. And, and guys tend to make it work a little bit, but like back 15 years ago, you'd see teams for a month, <laughs> yeah. but, <laughs> but not after that. Team, regional teams. Like I'll be your friend when we're in your it, part of the world, exactly. yeah. but I'm really busy at home. Right. <laughs> I'm only going to talk to you when we're coming to your lake and then I ain't talking to you. <laughs> I think that's the other big advantage they have is, and, and they've actually said it themselves. When Chris sees something or says something, Corey doesn't doubt it. And Absolutely. vice versa. I mean, they argue about everything on earth, everything, but they, they implicitly t trust each other. They know that one of them's not trying to, which also yeah. makes me think about like, when you think that you've got three out of the last four years that one of them has been at, in the top three for angler of the year. Yeah. It almost makes me wonder if they weren't working together. Like, does, does that help you do better in angler of the year or throughout the year at some point, one of them had to succeed to the, you know what I mean? Like maybe they would have well, won and, already. And, and, and you, you know this, and it's a very odd dynamic, but when one of them is not performing in an event, or vice versa, whatever, because I've seen it with both of them. Yeah. Having to lay down a little bit. <laughs> right? It's like two and, dogs. And look, it, 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 it pisses both of them off to the highest extent, but they both do that. They will lay off. So the other one, except that's a, an amazing dynamic, dude. Yeah. Especially as ultra competitive as those two goons are with each other they'll they'll back down throughout a tournament that is so weird 
to see that dynamic. And, and I've covered it long enough with them, and you have too, to where it's now normal to us. But when you say that to somebody, they're like, what do you, what do you, uh, like one will back off. It's yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah, it, it's wild. I mean, it has a lot to do with the fact that they put all the money in one account. I think that exactly. keeps you very a lot easier to lay off <laughs> when you're making is, dollars. It, it's it's um, Corey. Corey was while we were live last week for two weeks ago for for the Mississippi River. And it was Brian Schmidt and, and Chris. I had never received that many texts from Corey in my entire lifetime of dude you know you know you know who's gonna win tell me what what you know where is it at where is it at where which obviously shows the split of the bank account he was that concerned <laughs> you mentioned hackney you and him are very tight do you notice a different hackney since he's come back or any changes um i think greg is happy in his life and mm -hmm. career now um greg's a handful dude yeah you, you look he is a handful you know it, it, it's he's i think he's it, it's funny i made a comment to him right before he went back into the opens and i could tell he genuinely was not comfortable where he was at obviously what where he was at in his career, where, you know, and that, that's not a slam on no. where, where he at all, but he was bitching and moaning. And, and, and I looked and I, I remember saying this, dude, you, and, and I exact words I used to you at the beginning of this podcast is I said, you don't have a lot of innings left in, in this career that you've been so dominant in. I said, great. This is going to be the most simple advice I've ever given you. Find a way to be happy. Find a way to be happy. Whatever it takes, you deserve for everything, for busting your behind, you deserve the last few innings of your career to be happy. You just have to, have to figure out how to get there. And he got there. Um, and I think it, I think. Um, he probably doesn't put, he, the dude puts a lot of pressure on himself, especially, it, and, and I've seen it at classics because I've asked him about this, is he hates classic week while loving it at the same exact time. Um, I, I think he's in a little, probably a little bit of the same boat that you're in, that I'm in, in a different spectrum of this. Um, I think he probably is enjoying it, stepping back and smelling the roses a little bit more than you do when you're in survival mode 15 years ago. Yeah. One of the coolest moments I saw this year that nobody, I mean, maybe people saw, but I just really, it stood out to me is I watched Hackney at the toast when Christy won. And I watched the exact moment when they walked up yes. and nobody it wasn't public or anything. I was yeah. just, I mean, we might have been standing together, but I just, you know, when you're standing there, you look, you look over and I'm like, this is the first time they're talking since he won. And literally Hackney stopped and he looked at Christy and he looked at the trophy and back at Christy. And it was like two like giant bucks that just respected each other. But like, exactly. you know, I hate you a little bit now because <laughs> you yes. got what I want. It, it, um, but I think that's the coolest thing about the sport. Like, I don't think you should be. I think the thing that I hate in fishing is when everybody tells everybody across the stage and smile, everybody be happy about it. You want Greg Hackney should want the Bassmaster Classic more than anything. It's the only thing he, he hasn't achieved. I'll give you a Christie. That's weird that you're, that you're reflecting on that is I was alone with Christy one time. He goes, man, you fish with, you fish with Hackney a lot, don't you? And I said, yeah. I said, we spent a lot of time in the boat. And he goes, I have the most respect for Greg Hackney just for the, his style. I said, hey, bro, you're the same creature. You're both the same creature. Like, I, I think his respect for Greg Hackney, because I'll, I'll, I remember this, a story Christy gave me 
there was a two day tournament. The first time he met Greg Hackney in Arkansas, it was either Arkansas or Oklahoma. He had known his name, right? And for anybody that I, we all know Greg Hackney on the Elite Series and everything he's done, but he was possibly the best Arkansas River fisherman ever. Okay. And, and, and I, I knew his name back before I fished against Hackney on Ever Starts back in the day. So anyway, um, Christy said, dude, I showed up. I showed up to this tournament. It was a two-day tournament. You'll love this story. You'll love this story. And he said, I, I, I met Greg Hackney in the morning of this tournament. It was a regional championship. And he goes, dude, I went out, caught like 13 pounds. Hackney caught like nine and he's like dude's got nothing dude has no game he goes until the next day when hackney brought in five that weighed like 29 pounds and lapped the entire he's like that's the dude i heard about <laughs> <laughs> they're very similar they're really really similar like in the way that like and i, I would go off the water yeah and if you look at their fans the people that follow them that are like hardcore hackney fans and chris they're they're intermingle you know what i yeah. mean like the ones yes. that like if those two go head to head who knows who they'll cheer for but it like yes. it is the hardcore uh, modern day denny brower maybe absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely like it's it's weird because denny i've, I've you, denny and i've become very 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 close we we text all the time dude hated my guts when <laughs> hated me hated me and and it it like I, it was vice versa too. Like at first, at first. So this was pre Mercer times. Yeah. So and it was kind of when it's kind of when the internet was going here with content, right? And and we were probably very invasive compared to the past. Compared to the past. Yeah. And 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 Denny and and I had some rough no i had rough moments because he would just light me up like a christmas <laughs> and and here's the problem dave here's here was my problem growing up in chicago and then moving to michigan and watching that dude with a flipping stick back in the nashville network days I, I, i've heard seth fighter say you wanted to emulate you wanted to be that dude right so then all of a sudden I'm covering the Bassmasters and that dude is so mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is, hey Dave, what's funny is we've spent a lot of time together. I've spent a lot of time with Denny. He's like, oh yeah. Oh, I, I could not stand working with you at those turns. I hated it. I'm like, why are you saying these things to me? <laughs> and hey, I, you know what's funny is I ran into that with, with guy, you know, like Denny, I ran into that with Clun. Um, Clun even, we, we were having dinner together and he goes, oh, I remember the one time I was mean to you. Do you remember it? I said, yeah, yeah, I remember it, Rick. And I <laughs> made you're going to forget the day Rick Clun was mean to you. Right. And, and it was, it was due, it was literally due to a lost fish. He lost a seven pounder on a frog in one of those Alabama River tournaments. And I walked up to him at, after weigh-in. Uh, and, and he's like, you honestly really just need to get away from me right now. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I just got tuned up by Rick Clun. And I was like, fine, Rick, I will. I will leave. Um, but it was funny because we, we, we can laugh about it now. How amazing is he? Like, just when you think that Rick Clun can't get any more amazing with the things he's accomplished. Like I think the last four years for me has just shown me that like, I knew this amazing character, but now I know this amazing human being and, yes. and maybe it's always been there, but I didn't, there was always an aura around Rick Clun. You know what I mean? For years, like you, you wouldn't bother Rick, you know, and he was always nice to me. We'd talk, but you wouldn't want to interrupt him. Like other anglers time on a spinner bait. You're like, Hey, can I talk to you? You have no problem. But when Rick's time went on, you're like, I don't want to mess but I've watched him put his arm around rookies and make an effort. Like, I think 
like he totally changed his head the way he looks at tournaments. And dude, I've seen more smiles from Rick Clun in the last yes. few years than I probably saw in a decade before that. And he, um, he's incredible. He is a very and a very dry, sarcastic <laughs> sense of humor <laughs> that is so much more intelligent than you and I combined. Like when he'll make a joke, he won't laugh at first. And you're like, oh my gosh, you just shredded me. <laughs> he, he, Dude, one morning at takeoff, he's idling out. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff goes on at takeoff. He's not the only one that's ever done this, but he hit the dock, right? He's idling past and he's, you know, somebody's yelling at him. He's got all sorts of stuff going on. And he looks away and he hits the dock, like right where I'm standing. And I'm, I make some, creep of uh, like i'm like oh rubbin's racing or whatever and he looks up at me he's like i wasn't aiming for the dock i missed you <laughs> so so fantastic there there you know what was there there was one rick Klein story and it was probably four or five years ago um we were sitting alone and i just got home from lake huron and I, I, I made a really, really long run into the lake and we were taping and I, and I found one of those schools, Dave, shallow, that I was convinced. I made this comment. I was convinced those fish had never seen man. They were the most unintelligent bass. They would come up, they would, and I've seen this before, they've come up, they would look at the head of your trolling motor. And I was telling Rick this and I got done, he goes, I really appreciate you telling me that story that that there are fish like that still out there He goes, that story really made me happy right there and just walked away. I'm like, wow, he was actually paying attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he is that guy like when like when you're telling the story to me, I think I'm just I've got an animated face like, you know, if I'm into it or if I'm yes. away. Rick can just like Jedi mind trick, like Rick is no longer here. That's right. That's right. Rick, are you listening to me right now? Right. <laughs> he told me, he told me we were at Bass Pro Shop. And he said, Karen, Karen's on my left, Rick's on my right. And we're sitting there, we were having a cocktail, just talking. And he goes, I really, really didn't like you on television when you first started the, the, the Bass Masters. I'm like, <laughs> Really? And he's like, oh no. He goes, I love it now. He, he goes, you, you, you have a very photographic memory. He goes, oh no, but those first two years, he goes, no, I, I didn't like you. I'm like, I didn't like you either, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> like, and he said it's so matter of fact. I'm like, what yeah. the hell are you talking about, Rick? Come on. <laughs> your childhood, I'm, you're my idol, and you're just telling me how you didn't like me. I like looked over at Karen. I was like, Rick, Rick just said he hated me when I first started this. She's like, at least he's honest. <laughs> <laughs> he is definitely, he is mm -hmm. definitely honest. Okay, I want your honest opinion. And before I let you get back to Labor Day festivities, forward facing sonar, everybody's talking about it's the most over talked about and too much talk about in some ways. What's your take on forward-facing sonar? Because it honestly is the first technology that I'm like, this is different. Man. I love it. Mm -hmm. Forward-facing sonar is a lot like your fantasy football team. The only person that has fun with it really is you. Really, <laughs> I'm being that honest. True. It, True. It, 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 there, are, there is a connection. There absolutely is a connection with forward-facing sonar and young anglers. That's yeah. a big-time connection. The other thing that I've learned is, man, I hate calling tournaments that are all. I oh. hate, hate them. They're very challenging. The Oahe tournament was one I looked. I came down two or three days into that event, sat down and looked at Karen, and I said, I'm a k calling an event where maybe two or three or four of the top 10 are using forward-facing sonar but when 10 out of 10 are doing it it's frighteningly similar to a bed fishing tournament when 10 out of 10 are bed fishing because you have no diversity in there yeah right look there is going to be technology eventually 
that we will be able to split screen. There's the angler. There's his screen that he's looking at. If anglers would be open. Look, there's some anglers I can tell you right now, whatever organization they fish, they don't want anybody seeing that screen because they have an advantage and don't want people yeah. getting the juice. But I do think that that there will come a day where we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to watch. I, I hope that happens just so it makes it more entertainment and entertaining. Uh, but to cliff notes for that question, look, it's technology. It, it, and I am, I've always said this. I, I, if I was always up for the umbrella rig. Yeah. It's, there's something out there. Uh, Dave, you know that you fished with me with that thing. To me, it, it, there's an evolution. Um, and there's going to be people that hate it. Uh, there's people that are going to love it, but it is, it, it's, it's just what happens in the world. Yeah. Things get better. You know, I, I remember looking at a GPS. Heck, you can go as far as to say mapping. Mapping has changed the Tennessee River forever. Forever. So anybody that bitches about forward-facing sonar, you better be all in on everything. You could say it about mapping. You could say it about waypoints everything um and and there look and i respect i respect any human being that says hey that is not for me if, if you're a purist be that but i don't think it's up to anybody to go hey you shouldn't do that yeah yeah only thing i will say for coverage, what do you think about it <clears throat> I, i'm right there with you like i think it's one of when you're using it it is one of the most amazing tools and it becomes incredibly addictive because all of a sudden like you said it makes everything a sight fishing tournament that's why sight fishing is so addictive because even if the fish doesn't bite your bait you see how it reacted to it you get another little crumb of the yes puzzle but watching it is something different like well and why he stood out to me and and i said the exact same thing it's not that i don't like looking at it it's when everything becomes all of that and i also think it does something different and it makes you antisocial right away like if you watch somebody like when you're sight fishing you're talking you're throwing that bait and yeah. you're saying oh he's turning he's this and Jake Latondras last week on the podcast had a great example for it, which I was going back and forth trying to explain what I meant. He's like, it's talking to somebody when they're on their cell phone. That's exactly what it is. And if you watch the anglers, wow. they are so dialed into it's just like if I was sitting here trying to figure out what I'm going to draft in our fantasy football draft tonight. Um, I'm not paying attention to you and I'm disengaged. And that's yes, why yes, I think it's, yes. it's so much more than what I've seen in other things. So so as far as coverage, I think I, I hate that part of it. Let me throw something back at you. You are host of a fishing show. Mm -hmm. I have caught myself this year in exactly the mode you just said over and over and over and over and over again to where this is scout's honor. We When we were at Lake Ontario, I finally looked at ca cameraman Brian Eby and I said, we're going shallow and throwing a bladed jig. I am done looking at that thing. <laughs> let's go do, let's go do what we used to. Corey Johnston made a comment in that show that I taped with him. Th this is telling. Dude, it, to, to forward facing sonar for two people to be on the front of the boat doing that. Two bulls in the boat like oh. uh, up front with Corey, dude i just start casting remember the days we used to do that like throwing out <laughs> hope i get a bite i caught a four and a half pounder and Corey goes wow did you catch that fishing <laughs> <laughs> strange say that to yourself Dave. did you did you catch that fishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i said casting is fun <laughs> Seth Fighter, man, and I've said a bunch of times he and he this was three years ago, probably he said this to me, and I and I think it's living up to it. He said it's just gonna be a big casting contest one day. 
because he said they're just going to get better and you're going to see further and that's how it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's going to be, and you see how the fish are, I mean, Takumi says it on the stage all the time, chasing, chasing all day. Yes. 45 minutes and people are like, oh, he's fishing for, no, he's literally hooking his bumper onto the back of a fish and chasing it for 45 yes. minutes. And Takumi believes that he'll out, you know, he'll figure the fish out and the fish will sooner or later bite. And how can you argue with his success? It something else that I think obviously, and I'll go to the tournament, the Patrick Walters tournament at Lake Fork was yeah. kind of one of those open it opened your eyes to the most confusing fish on earth is a suspending bass this is the, the, the real quick story vandy my my camera boat driver who i used to fish tournaments with growing up uh, we're going where i'm taking taku to a lake north of here that my buddy is not winning tournaments on this lake he is destroying tournaments dave like First place every week, he has 21 to 23 pounds. Second place is eight pounds. And the way he is catching them right now with his forward-facing sonar is not normal. It's not like you're literally just chasing smelt out in 80 feet of water. Large mouth, I'm talking. Large mouth. You are chasing smelt 45 feet down in 80 feet of water and not catching five or six big ones a day. He's catching like 30 to 50 a day. Wow. Dude, that is, again, that's eye-opening. That, And here's what I do think, what, what Seth said, I agree with, but at the same time, it is teaching us things right now that I don't care what, art, what writer in bass fishing, there are things being learned right now with that that have never ever been known or learned like what? like 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 here's a here, here's a perfect case there are salmon fishermen that i hang with up on huron or on lake michigan that would always tell me yeah dude i caught i caught a five pound yeah. smallmouth in 110 feet of water 50 feet down and you kind of do a yeah whatever that's a ghost it's not a ghost anymore you know what i mean yeah they're out there they're out there and that's what that's what a like to me that amazes me that kind of stuff to where i do give the, i mean that to, that's the positive because it teaches you us things that we did not know previously in bass fishing yeah well look at texas parks of wildlife and how their share lunker program has exploded the last few years everybody's seeing what's happening Absolutely. on hiv and you talk to the folks that run that program. And I've straight up said, why is it happening? And they give you reasons. But of the three reasons they give you, they did an incredible program stocking OHIV. You know what I mean? It's right. also water levels have, it just worked out right with the pattern, you know, that they can, it, there's big fish in that fishery right now. But the other reason that they never leave out is technology and they're like, absolutely. The biggest fish spend the majority of their time out suspending. Out. And we have not been able to fish them, catch them, or figure out any way to get them. And now they are. And that's what's happening down there. The, the, the little the little lake that I live on that you, you fished here with me yeah. many times is uh, what I have learned that I did not know is the incredible amount of fish that live the majority of their their days are suspenders just what it is and, and that it, that's been probably the most cool thing is what i like probably the most is to see how they react to baits how they don't react to baits to see that behavior is we always thought things like man i think they're suspended yeah. right and then we'd mark one on our 2D and oh well, look, there is one suspended. No, you you and and the, the, there it's this is a this is one more dorky, dorky, cool story. Is we've grown up in the world of hey, I caught a small mouth right here, I'm gonna throw it back. And, and we always heard that it'll spook a school or it won't, and people call BS on that. I have watched this with my eyes. 
I have let a small mouth go multiple times. And I'll watch that fish on my forward facing sonar. I'll watch the school come up to him, the one I just released, and go, whoop, gone. That, that teaches you. It teaches you that, hey, that old wives tale, when you let one go, does it spook a school? I have seen it with my eyes now. It absolutely at times does. Do you think they communicate or do you think it's just like it's down there shaking its head or doing? It, 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 here's what was the, the, what, what I saw. I wish I could have recorded it. I was with Van Dam. We were out here and we were on a big school of largemouth. And then there was a, a pack of six. I plinked out. I caught it. And it was a two and a half pound smallmouth. And I and you know Kevin, he's he's a nutbag too, and he's staring at the screen. And I let the fish, I literally let the fish go. And the five rose up, and they they all like it's weird. The the bass I had just released went directly to where those five were, and they were suspended about 10 feet under the surface. And I watched them and they just went <clears throat> and Van Dam wow. went. Van Dam goes, whoa. Did you see that? I'm like, yeah, I did. And he's like, that just told a story right there. Like, dude, how did that bass know in the whole spectrum of where he could swim to, to swim directly within 1.2 seconds to where the five that he was hanging with, he went right to him to where you're like, how did you know that? Your wow. brain is that, your brain is that big. How did you know that? It was bizarre, but it was very eye-opening, very eye-opening. Probably really messed with Kevin. Now he releases fish immediately. <laughs> right. He's, he's like, caught himself in a horrible hell now that he's seen that. And every time he catches ways and releases, ah, oh, no well, wonder. He is, one of, he is one of the dudes back in the old school days. I remember watching him uh, on Lake St. Clair in an FLW tournament. Catching them running to the back of the boat, releasing them. Catching them running to the back of the boat, releasing them. I believe in it now. Like, I bo totally believe in it. Look, I've let them go shallow and watch the school break up. But to watch that in a deep water situation, because I always thought, the damn school isn't getting spooked. Give me a break, whatever. Dude, if... They're going in my live well for a little while now before, you know, if, if I'm taping, I'll hang on to them for a minute or two before I'll let them go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I read back through the text I sent you. I said, do you, do you have 45 minutes sometime between before Tuesday that we can record? We'll talk about the new schedule and we haven't talked about that at all. So give me, some, give me a couple of minutes on what do you think of the new schedule? I mean, one thing I know about schedules, no matter what it is, if it's, if it's not on the nine lakes you live on, people are going to hate it. <laughs> Absolutely. You yeah. Know? But I, I do think, I do think uh, it's a very, very, very diverse schedule. Yeah. Uh, I like the timing. Like, I think the Santee Cooper one is really, really cool. Um, Cause it's going to be past the times that we usually go to Santa. The two that I look at and, and they're, they're captain obvious ones, but looking at that one and looking at, the Seminole tournament is in February. Yeah, right? it's the one right before the classic, right? Yeah, or... yeah. I, 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 those are the two that probably stuck out the most to me. Um, yeah. But what I like, what I like most about that schedule is it is a it is a very very diverse one. Being a homer, being a homer, obviously I like smallmouth tournaments and and you know especially smallmouth tournaments that are going to take you know, massive weights, but I, I do like the diversity of the schedule just because the whole, for the most part, the whole year will look and feel differently. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's good. Oh, wild pick angler of the year. Who's going to weigh ang angler of the year? Is he top of your angler? Head. Oh boy. It's a very early time to do that. I'm saying from a momentum standpoint, and I'd like to see the dude win it. I think Brandon Lester will get it done next year. Yeah. Great pick. Yeah. Great yeah. pick. 
I picked Austin Felix this year. He hated and, that. And he absolutely <laughs> did. Uh, yeah, gosh, he did just like, it's weird because he ended so absolutely dominant. But I, I made this comment on, on Bassmaster Live. I th- if you really watch Austin Felix and Brandon Lester, they are so frighteningly similar the way that they fish from shallow to deep very very similar anglers that come from two totally different spectrums of the world uh it, it's been interesting to watch like I, I thought about that you know especially during the Oahe event if you watch them fish how they fish from shallow to deep they're very similar fishermen both incredible anglers and Lester. I mean, it's, it seems like just people are starting to notice Lester for whatever reason, like fans. Yeah. But man, if you look at what he's done opens and deletes the last five years, it's, it's incredible. I mean, he's, uh, and I, that's what I hate about angler of the year. If you finish in top three for angler of the year, honestly, like everybody forgets about second place in angler of the year, even more so than the person who finished second for the classic second place in angler of the year, top three in angler of the year. It's literally one bite. Like it's all season long. And this year it came down to that bite that Paul Nick got with a half hour left to go on day number two to make it into the cup. Without that, Brandon Lester's your angler of the year. That was one of the strangest days of coverage this year when Polinick was so I think he was stunned how uh-huh. bad they he, he made the comment after the day one weigh-in you you guys were still weighing fish and I called him and I said look I don't want to be in your way let me just get a little bit of juice he said look man he goes I'm gonna catch 10 pounds fairly easy tomorrow morning but it, he goes it's just getting to that 12 to 13 pound mark that I have in my head. And then it was like 10 45 and he had zero. I think even he was like, Whoa. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 But battled through and uh, two time angler of the year and Z what's the plan for this afternoon. Just give us a reader's digest version of what kids listen, the kids are gone. The kids are gone. I, I, with Karen and I usually take a, a last lap on the pontoon boat. Um, I know this sounds, I, we cooked so much meat yesterday. I, I, I got to take a time out from grilling today. Uh, so the answer, Dave, I think fairly similar to the rest of your day. I'm doing nothing. I'm, doing nothing. I'm preparing for a fantasy draft tonight is what I'm doing. Yeah. I'll see you there. I'll see uh, you there. And I, well. I, I appreciate you doing this. I'm starting to get texts from your wife telling me not to bring up certain things. So that means it's time to end this podcast. The one understandable Z train. Thank you very much. Z love you. Thanks. Love you too, brother. As always, Mark Zona brings the heat. I thank him for such an open, honest and enjoyable conversation. And that's really all you can count on getting here week after week. And I thank you. Before we go any further, I have to say thank you once again to all of you for liking and subscribing these videos. We're currently at 144,000 YouTube subscribers and climbing every single day. Keep the grow going. Every single video of ours that you like, you comment, you're helping. That's your way of applauding. Applauding or If you want to make applause, no, you don't make applause. If you'd like to share some applause with with a YouTube video that you enjoy, just that's how you do it. You hit like, you leave a comment. Even if it's just a thumbs up, it really, really helps. And um, it really, really helps when we have great guests like Mark Zona. So I thank him for being here this week. Make sure to follow all his social stuff. I'll put it in a link in the comments. And um, I think that's all I got. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. And as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?